Hello, I'm Matthew Kahn, and in this brief video, I'd like to talk about uh, an idea in my new book, Going Remote, how the flexible work economy can improve our lives and our cities. So my book is about the persistence of work from home going forward in our post-COVID economy and the new geography of jobs. I talk about how people, those who are fortunate enough to be eligible for work from home will be affected going forward, how firms who incorporate work from home into their business practices will be rewarded by having a happier, more productive workforce. And I talk about the new geography of how different cities will be affected as more people have the option to engage in work from home. And an old University of Chicago theme is to celebrate competition. So in Enrico Moretti's great New Geography of Jobs book, he emphasized in our old economy, circa 2019, that there were certain productive spikes in the United States. So New York City, Boston, San Francisco, San Jose, Portland, Seattle, Silicon Beach. There were these few spiky places that were intrinsically productive um, for a variety of reasons that urban economists discuss. And that there was something sort of unfair about this, that these superstar cities paid very well, but because it's so difficult to build housing in these liberal cities, both because of their geography, but also NIMBY politics, that home prices were extremely high in these cities. And this rationed out the middle class and lowered the quality of life of the poor who lived in these cities because housing was just so expensive from the basics of supply and demand. A theme in my work from home book is that spatial competition will increase when workers have the right and the ability to engage in work from home, they can basically live anywhere. And the question is, people with different tastes and preferences will spread out. And so, in of course, San Francisco will continue to be a desirable place. And there's a durable infrastructure of buildings in San Francisco. In no sense do I believe that San Francisco is going to become a ghost town. Instead, my book focuses on the new freedoms people have that before 2020, if you wanted to be in tech, you had to be in Seattle or Silicon Valley. And for people who didn't want to live there, either because of the lifestyle or because of the extremely high home prices or the commuting involved, this meant this sort of Faustian trade-off that bundled into being part of the tech sector is that you had to live in this place. When we open up the work from home option, all sorts of permutations arise. An extreme example, the United States has 3,000 counties. In the past, if you had to live and work in the same county, you had a 3,000 dimensional choice. Going forward, work from home workers, if they can work at one mothership in one county and then live in any other county, then their number of permutations of where they work and where they live is actually 9 million as you can decouple where you live from where you work. Now, what my book talks about is back to supply and demand. Suppose many people now want to live in Bozeman, Montana, because that's their thing. There will be a demand for these footloose work from home workers to live in Bozeman, but will they be welcome in Bozeman? And this gets into the NIMBY issue, not in my backyard. For those desirable places, whether these are surfing communities, whether the, these are in Florida, uh, forever, for anywhere in the country, ski areas, uh, national parks areas, areas with beautiful weather, uh, a, a question is the shape of the residential real estate supply curve. Will communities that are in higher demand by work from home workers to live and work there, will they be welcomed in this place? Or will we see new nimbyism in the Bozeman Montanas? This is an open question. What I talk about in the book is part of the answer is farmland conversion. Farmland covers much of the United States. If there are desirable areas to live, especially in the face of climate change, climate is changing. Where do people want to live and how is that land currently zoned? More people can afford to live in areas and build new housing in these areas if zoning is such that real estate developers can acquire land, install infrastructure, and build housing there for people to live in. So 
One limit to growth would be if we see the same nimbyism in attractive work from home destination areas that we've seen in progressive cities like Portland, New York City, Boston, San Francisco. So much of the challenge that middle class people have faced in trying before the work from home revolution, before 2020, the challenge was that our superstar cities were elitist and were not building housing. If more people are eligible to engage in work from home, and if potential destination areas actually accommodate this growth by building housing and welcoming new people to move in, then there's tremendous gains to trade and middle-class quality of life could improve. My critics have asked, well, will any areas welcome newcomers? And what I want folks to think about is the United States is a big place. In many areas, the population is aging and shrinking. And so in those areas which are aging and shrinking, there could and should be a willingness to attract new blood to reinvigorate the place. Just as immigrants have played a key role in revitalizing areas when there are cheap house home prices, footloose work from home workers will consider areas that meet their quality of life preferences and that have ties to their social roots if they have roots in the community that a grandparent grew up there, if they're comfortable with the way of life in that area, even rural areas may attract work from home workers. And so a key theme in my book is the new geography of where we may live when we have the choice. Now, I don't predict that New York City's population is going to shrink by several million. Instead, I think we're going to have a musical chairs that those who really want to be in New York City, someone like my son, a 20-year-old who wants uh, the action of the big city, the nightlife, to meet people, to network, to learn. He's someone who might want to be there. But a middle-aged guy like me uh, might want to, to be somewhere more tied. I already have my networks. I already have my ways. I know what leisure I like to do. For people like me, opportunities just to live anywhere. So in a city like New York City with 10 million people, 1% of 10 million is 100,000. If 2% of New Yorkers leave the New York area because of the work from home option, that's 200,000 people, which is a drop in the bucket in New York City. But these 200,000 people are now thinking about where to live in the rest of the country. And if some community has 50,000 people, to attract some of these 200,000 people can change the course of that community. And in some sense, the opportunity for people to decentralize from superstar cities acts as a safety valve. If quality of life declines in these superstar cities, work from home workers on either a temporary basis, for example, if a fire breaks out in, in a Los Angeles or on a permanent basis can decentralize away from these cities. And so the ability to engage in work from home and to move anywhere, whether that's to an island with internet service or to live on a boat, or to Airbnb for a few months from a ski resort. These new freedoms improve our quality of life because of our geographic flexibility. And I don't think the New York Times has been discussing this idea, but my new book, Going Remote, certainly does, as I spend a lot of time on the new geography of our economy in a, now that we and millions of us have the work from home option.